All right, while you're turning to the passage I told you there in Isaiah, I'm going to quote 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If I were a banjo, I'd have but one string. This subject matters on my mind. It's been on my mind for so many months. It's still right here in front of us. I think it's so germane and important what we're talking about and what we're seeing today that I can't get off of this. But 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We notice in here there's my people, which are called by my name. They should be humble. They must pray, and we've been talking about that quite a bit here recently. The next thing in there, seek my face. What does God require of a people that his judgment may be removed? is the question that I have on my heart and what these messages have been seeking after. And then when combined with what is happening with pastor and when the, just the word of God where it leads us to, we have come right smack to the fact that we recognize that the problem is we, Amen. not everyone else out there, right. but we, right. and that we have a duty to exercise the spiritual disciplines of our faith if we're going to defeat a yes. spiritual enemy. Yes. Amen. And those... Those disciplines are, among other things, prayer primarily. But there is other thing, there are other things for us to do now that we're praying. But the word that really comes to mind to answer the question, repentance. And I've said, if repentance is the key to the removal of God's judgment, then prayer is the means for that repentance. We went through... The disciples' prayer, the Lord tells us how to pray. There were eight points we went over last week. First, we offer thanksgiving and praise to our God. Next, we request faithful service and submission to His will. We declare our daily dependence upon our Father. We bring our petitions in light of that dependence and submission to His will. We pray in His will. If God will, we will go and do such and such. We repent of sin. As I've explained it to teenagers for so many years, keeping a clean slate with God. We then request protection from sin and being any kind of hindrance of his will being done on earth. And we close with thanksgiving, with praise, and an, exception, and a, and an acceptance of our commission under the authority of Christ. Okay? And that's what we talked about last week about how to pray. We are to go forward in his power and for his purpose, purposes as ambassadors for Christ. Part and parcel with praying is seeking his face. What does it mean to seek his face? What does scripture say about that? That's going to be the focus of today's message. First, understand that God is eager to be found. Amen. He's eager to be found. Isaiah 45, verse 19, the passage I asked you to turn to, we'll read it together. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So the first point is God is eager to be found. John Gill's commentary. And I'm going to rely heavily on several commentaries here. Just so many times they put into words, you just can't make it any better. So bear with me as I do this. John Gill says, in reference to the part that says, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. He has not spoken in a private whisper, in a muttering manner, as the heathen priests did. Out from cells and caves and dark places and caverns of the earth from whence the oracles of the heathen deities were delivered. But in a free, open, clear, and public manner, our Lord spoke. Before multitudes, in the face of all men, where there was a great concourse of people. So Christ delivered the law on Mount Sinai in an audible manner, attended with a multitude of angels and before all the people. And, where, and when here on earth, he said nothing in secret, but openly to the world, even with the Pharisees trying to kill him. He spoke openly in the synagogues and in the temple of the Jews, where they resorted in great numbers and ordered his disciples also to publish on the housetops what they heard in their ears. So understand, disciple of Christ, and as we seek God, he is not making himself hard to find. He wants to be found. Okay? He, is, he is there proclaiming his wisdom in the open. 
I said unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. That is, he never suffered the seed of Jacob, the Israelites indeed, praying Jacob's and prevailing Israelis, the true church, the worshipers of him today, the body of Christ today, to seek him in vain. He never said that you will be in vain when you try to seek me, is what I'm saying. To pray unto and worship him with no purpose or without fruit for themselves. For all, who, for all such who seek him early and earnestly, heartily and diligently, and where he may be found, always find him. He receives them. He does not reject them. And they receive that from him which is worth seeking after and amply rewards all their trouble. The Lord is there in heaven. He, he's giving us his Holy Spirit now in the new covenant age of grace. He is waiting and longing to hear from his children. He is eager to be found when we seek him. And that was true in the Old Testament, and we're going to pull a lot of verses throughout Scripture, and you'll see this. This is his character, his nature. It changes not, all right? So the same, like we've said before, the same things are true of God in the Old Testament, his character, his nature. The principles of natural law and God's law are the same. We can know that he's going to treat us the same way today when we do the things that God's Word says to do. And there's great hope in that. That means we don't have to just hope on these heathen and godly people to do the right thing. No, we have the power to pray and to affect God for God's work on earth to be done. Amen? Amen. That is, he never suffered the seed of Jacob in Israel to seek him in vain, to pray on and to worship him with no purpose, without fruit to themselves. Uh, he, he rewards them amply for their trouble. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, the rest of the verse, the word of righteousness, the doctrine of justification by his own righteousness, that which he, Christ, wrought out by his obedience, his sufferings, his death. He declared and brought near in the ministry of the word, grace and truth came by Christ. The point here is that God is see wants to be found if we will seek him. Yeah. I declare things that are right, according to right reason, agreeably to the word of God, both law and gospel, fit for men to receive, and what made for his own and his father's glory. Think back to the disciples' prayer. We start off by acknowledging that his rep with reverence, his glory, and his majesty. And then right off the bat, we ask him that his will be fulfilled in earth as it is in heaven. It is for his glory, for his honor, that we diligently and submissively pray and seek him. It's not for our glory. It's not for our wants. It's for our to use our prayers upon our own lust, but for that his will will be done. We are talking about being ambassadors for Christ, disciples of Christ, not just mere labeled Christians. Yes. Now a little bit from Matthew Henry. And as he has in his word invited them to seek him, so he, God, never denied their believing prayers, nor disappointed their believing expectations. He said not to them, to any of them, seek you me in vain. For if he did not think, now listen to this, we're right here in praying for our pastor. And so many times, as I've said before, when we pray and we quit praying because we don't get the answer we thought we wanted, which a lot of that would be solved if we came in the right attitude to begin with. But listen to this, what Matthew Henry says. He said not unto them, to any of them, seek ye me in vain. For if he did not think it fit to give them the particular thing they prayed for, yet he gave them such a sufficiency of grace and of such comfort and satisfaction of soul that were equivalent to the thing they asked. Amen. Let that sink in. That when... When we are praying and we're trying, this, when we're talking about disciples of Christ, we're talking about those that earnestly are seeking God and asking to help us to seek in his will. And yet in times because of the frailties of the flesh, we're not exactly praying in his will because he knows it and we don't. And then the answer doesn't come. He instead gives us the grace and the satisfaction of the circumstances that he gives us in our lives that the answer may have well have been given that we expected. Wow, what an amazing God that we serve like that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's funny, oftentimes, if you ever teach teenagers very long, you learn very quickly that young teenagers and young adults, they love hypotheticals. They love hypotheticals. If, well, what about this? Or what about this? You know, and they love to pull out, well, if God, could God make a rock too big for him to move? You know, that kind of stuff. It's just all the time with teenagers. Um, 
And so you just, you kind of get used to this. I, I told people, sometimes they give questions that, you know, quite frankly, I don't have a good answer for, believe it or not. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But I tell you what, whatever happens, when you get to heaven, you will not be disappointed, right? You will not be disappointed, whatever's there. So sometimes that's our prayer life. That when we're praying with the right spirit, maybe we don't have the details right, but God, as we pray, molds our spirit to reveal to us his will. He gives us the answer via a way that we would never expect, but it's as of much grace and sufficiency as if we had given to us the thing we had asked. An amazing God we serve. Psalm 8411. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That's what we're talking about. So we seek him. What does this mean? The first point that we have here is that he is willing to be found. He's ready to be found. Secondly, we see that when we seek him in his will, his way that we may judge ourselves thereby. We seek him that we may judge our own ways by God's standard. 1 Corinthians 11.31, for if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Just as an aside, this is where if we, for, if we will judge ourselves, we should not be judged. A nation that is going to live in liberty is only attained and only maintained by a self-governing people. Amen. That is why. Okay? Because we are holding ourselves accountable to a higher That's law. Right. Right? And that's why the founding fathers were so clear to say, look, if you want to have this republic, it's only going to be adequate for a moral and righteous people. Right. Right. Lamentations. Let's keep looking here. What does it mean to seek him? We seek him because we know he knows or we know he has made it clear that he wants to be found. We seek him so that we may compare our ways with his standard. Lamentations chapter three and verse 40. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Seek the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto the God in the heavens. Matthew Henry's commentary. Let us search and try our ways. Instead of murmuring and complaining, let us search for something that may support and comfort, teach and instruct under afflictive providences. Let us search into the love of God for whom all afflictions, from which all afflictions do spring from the love of God. Let us search into the covenant of grace in which provision is made for the afflictions in case of disobedience and for the supports under them. Let us search the scriptures written for our comfort. And it is much if we do not find some in the instances and the examples and experiences of other saints therein recorded. Let us search after a greater degree of knowledge of Christ, of his grace. So shall we be more comfortable to his sufferings and death and patient under our troubles. Let us search into our own hearts and examine ourselves whether we have true repentance of sin, true faith in Christ, and whether he is in us and we have a part in him, which will make us easy in every state. Now, I got to be clear, and I'm going I'm to expound upon this further here later in the message, but this is in the sense of sanctification, not and sanctification and communion. He's not referencing a questioning of our salvation here. This has to be clear. Okay. What he's saying, what the commentator here is saying, Matthew Henry, is that as we search to make sure that our hearts are right and that we're in compliance with God, we're not talking about, am I saved? No, that gets settled right at the beginning. Amen. Okay. What this is talking about is, are we in compliance with God's will? Are in his, in his, do we have communion with him? Do we have his blessing because of obedience and, be, and not under the chastening hand of God? Remember, all whom he loves, he chastens. Yeah. So that's what's in view here. As we seek, let us search into our present condition. If we find ourselves under the affliction of God. I was doing this message, working on it all yesterday, afternoon and evening, and all this was coming together. I didn't know what pastor's letter was gonna say that Sarah just read. As pastor's talking about bringing afflictions to drive us to pray, I'm looking at the same thing in these commentaries. It's amazing to me how the Holy Spirit orchestrates these things together. Okay. Understand this is not just the contrivances of man trying to make something out of the circumstances. This is God who is working on the behalf of us individually as a church and as a nation that we see or we're seeing here. And praise God for that. So let us search into our present condition. If we find ourselves under affliction of God in order to find out the cause of it, which is sin ultimately, and the end of it, which God has in it for our good. 
Let us search our ways and try them by the word of God, the standard of faith and practice, and see what agreement there is between them, that is between God's word and between our ways. Let us try our thoughts, our words and actions by the law of God, which is holy, spiritual, just, and good, and we shall see how abundantly short they come of it, that is our ways. And let us try our ways and compare them with the ways of God, which, is, which he has prescribed in his word, and we shall find that the only one that that the, one are, that the one are holy, God's word, the other unholy, our ways. The one plain and the other crooked. The one dark and the other light. The one pleasant and peace is in them and the other not. The one leads to life and the other to death. There is a law that exists outside of us. Understand that, right? We are not gods. There is one God and one law giver and that is God and it springs from his nature and his character yeah. he defines truth by the essence of who he is yeah. and the word reflects this the revealed law and we bring our lives into compliance with it and thereby have his joy and his peace and his comfort and his strength and his power and when we are outside of that outside of the protective shield of God's covering now we are not available to have those things to us as a teenager, I told the crowd before, as a teenager and in high school, I was already saved when I was young, but you would have never met a more miserable person in your life. I was a saved Christian teenager, but not living for God, living for self, and the most miserable person in the world that you would come into contact with. But when we seek God, we can avoid that, you understand? And turn again to the Lord by repentance, getting a little, and I'm going to, Look, I get a little ahead of what the verses are talking about in our sample text from Second Chronicles. We're parked on the idea of seeking God, and it's seeking God, and then that verse in Second Chronicles 4.17 says, then to turn. After you seek him, to turn. But I have to go through this in order for it to make complete sense. By repentance, we are looking for how does God remove his judgment from a people, and the word is repentance. The method is prayer, and then we, we seek God as we're doing so. Let us turn from our sinful ways upon a search and examination of them, and turn to the Lord, his ways, and worship from whom we have departed and against whom we have sinned, acknowledging our iniquities who, who receives graciously and is ready to forgive and does abundantly pardon. Seeking God is bringing one understanding that God wants to be found and can be found, and two, understanding that our seeking God is to compare our lives with his standard, that we may bring it into conformity with him. Okay, that's the point here. Adam Clark, let us search. How are we to get the pardon of our sins? The prophet tells us. One, let us examine ourselves. Let us turn again to the Lord. Let us seek him. Let us lift up our heart. Let us make fervent prayer and supplication for mercy. The phrase, lift up our hand. A couple of ways you can take that. I said earlier, whenever we talk about praying without wrath, uh, no, that's not the verse, we're praying with lift, lifting up holy hands. Does that mean physically lifting up hands that are holy? Well, maybe, yes. But more so than physically, what it means is it means living, lifting up a life that's in compliance with God's word. Okay? Lifting up a life that's in submission to God's will. I'm going to hit this later. Not a perfect life. Okay? That's not going to happen until we get to heaven but a life that the conversation of our life is the seeking God's will, this, this matter of seeking his face is what's in, in view here. Lift up, lift, let, let us lift up our hand, let us solemnly promise to be his, bind ourselves in a covenant to be the Lord's only. This harkens back to the disciples' prayer we talked about, actually, by submitting ourselves to his will, that he is our Lord, our source, our daily bread. All of that is in view. And the Lord, when he was telling us how to pray, had this in view. So much lifting up the hand to God implies. Or let us put our heart in our hand and offer it to God. Get that picture in your mind. Of lifting my heart, not, not, not my heart, but my heart, lifting up my heart to God and saying, this is yours. It's kind of like the analogy of I don't write a check, fill out the amount and ask God to sign it. I endorse the check, I leave it blank, and let, it have, let him have it to fill out as he pleases. That's what's in view here. I'm seeking God. I've submitted. I'm already at the place where I'm humble. 
I'm already at the place where I've come to the end of myself. I'm already to the place where I've seen the affliction around me and I understand I'm in trouble, I need help, and it's not going to come from me. Amen. I've already gotten to that point. I've been praying, now I'm seeking God. This is what's in view. We have transgressed. Let our confession of sin be fervent and, severe and, and sincere. So are we letting anything be on the throne of our life besides Christ? Anything. A job, a person, a hobby, a place, finances, anything. The question for the ambassador of Christ is, is there anything on the throne of your heart other than Christ himself? If there is, you're going to be miserable. God will not allow an idol in the heart of a disciple. The best way you could do to harm somebody or something is to make it an idol. God will destroy it. Uh, I didn't, I, this is not my notes, but I'll give you a little testimony here when I was a teenager. Part of the reasons why I was so miserable as a teenager. I told you I was running from God, doing my own thing. Oh, I was sealed. The Holy Spirit was very, no, I knew the Holy Spirit was convicting me. There was no question of that. But I just had my mind set on things I wanted to do. And when I was going into high school, I was going to play football, and I was, I was playing quarterback and stuff, and I had people scouting me in middle school from high schools, and I should have been, and whatever. That was my idol at that time. It was football. It was sports. That's all I cared about. Uh, good grades. Well, I, you know, I did uh, weird thing. I, I'd be on the bus going to high school, and they'd say, I don't need to get your homework done. Yeah, I did. And they'd say, man, you're weird. You always get your homework done. Well, well, yeah, I know. I just, I, there's something in me that couldn't stand to have to displease some authority that was saying, did you get your homework done? I just never wanted to say no. That, that drove me. Aside, but that big school was not important to me. It, it just wasn't anything important. What was important was football and playing football and lifting weights and all that kind of stuff. That was what was important to me. That was my idol. It had been since I was five. See, when I was five years old, I, what, you really since you were five? Yes, I'm telling you. I can remember this as clear as day. My, my father and his uh, partner, they sold insurance together. And, and my partner's name was Jeff. And Jeff had sons that were a little older than me. Actually, he had one daughter and one son. But he had one son that was a little older than me. So he coached Little League football. And my dad also played football all his life and almost went into college and stuff. So dad played football. And then I'll go out there, I'm a five-year-old kid, and I'm seeing dad coaching football with these big kids. They're like eight. <laughs> big kids. Yeah. And I know a five-year-old boy goes out there and sees his dad coaching and sees those big guys playing football. Well, that's why I, I remember to this day I said, told my mom, I was walking behind her. We were walking there to go watch that. And I told mom, I said, that's what I'm going to do. And she said, no, you're not. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> Idol was formed. And I chased that thing all the way. Until I was 18 in senior. God made sure the circumstances didn't work out. I mean, mind you, I, when I was in middle school, I had high school coaches scouting me. I should have gone to college and played football. God orchestrated those circumstances so that it didn't happen, folks. And God will do that. He will destroy your idols. He will have no idols, no gods before him. If you're a child of God, the quickest way to be miserable is to run from God and set idols up in your life. Well, that's true of adults. I believe that's true of many of us as Christians today. And that's why we're seeing the things we're seeing. But don't let anything be on the throne of your heart except Christ. Anything. I told you about that cool truck I had in high school. And just... First gear, I'm my man. Second gear, I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours. To the best of my ability, I will not set anything on the, heart of, the throne of my heart that would compete with you. You have that place. Changed everything. Changed everything. The joy, the liberty, the removal of a thousand ton weight on your shoulders. Don't. Oh, dear Christian, don't let anything be on the throne of your heart except for Christ. Are you seeking him? Philippians 3.8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. More on what it means to seek him. 
Proverbs 8, 17. I love them that love me, and, who, and those that seek me early shall find me. Matthew Henry. They shall be happy in the success of their inquiries after him. Those that seek me early, seek an acquaintance with me and an interest in me, seek me early. That is, seek me earnestly. Seek me first before anything else. Are you hearing that? Christ shall be theirs and they shall be his. He never said, seek in vain. John Gill, and those that seek me early shall find me. John Gill has some amazing, uh, some great commentaries on this matter of seeking him. So I'm going to rely heavily on him. And they, those, that is those that seek him early. And they are such who see their need of Christ, know the worth of him, and those seek to him in the use of means, the word and ordinances. I'm going to talk about ordinances a little bit later. And as assisted by his spirit for grace, for pardon, righteousness, life, salvation, which are only to be had in Christ. And they, and they, and they may be said to seek him early or in the first place above all things otherwise, and that the greatest eagerness and earnestness, diligence and importunity, and such always are successful. They find Christ and life and righteousness and salvation in him and every blessing and are therefore happy. Everything in the life of the disciple, if you are an ambassador for Christ, is to be filtered first through the word of God and his will. You understand? Everything. Every decision, every philosophy that you hold, every matter of truth. Brother, you knew what it was like when you came to the truth of realizing error, and then now we got to unlearn all these things? Well, how much better would it be for us if when we get in trouble, the first thing we did was say, what does God's word say about this? What does God want me to do? Instead of, uh, what does the world tell me to do with this? Wouldn't we be much happier? And that's what's in view here. You know, this can't be just a Sunday thing, folks. Yeah, this is not just a going to a ritual ceremony once a week and calling it good. That's not what's in view. That's what God is demanding is that we seek him. What does that seeking him mean is what I'm after here. Not as a second door, secondary or even lower happenstance, but the first thing. Adam Clark, I love them that love me. Wisdom shows itself, teaches man the knowledge of himself, shows him also the will of God concerning him, manifests the snares and dangers of life and allurements and unsatisfactory nature of all sensual and sinful pleasures, the blessedness of true religion, and the solid happiness which, might upright, which an upright soul derives from the peace and approbation of its maker. We're talking about, you see what's going on? We're talking about communion here with Christ. We're talking about fellowship with Christ. We're talking about sanctification. Justification has been settled. If that weren't true, we wouldn't be a child of God. There would be no rebuking of God. There would be no afflictions of God. We would just be running around, not even knowing anything's going on. But we're talking about the child of God here, the one who seeks him. If then the heart embraces this wisdom, follows this divine teaching, and gives itself to God, God's love will be shed abroad in it by the influence of the Holy Spirit. Thus we love God because he first loved us. And the more we love him, the more we shall feel his love, which will enable us to love him yet more and more. And thus we may go on, we may go on increasing to, in earn, to eternity. Blessed be God. Amen. Amen. What's in view here, folks, is daily communion with Christ. A disciple of Christ, an ambassador for Christ. If we want to see God's judgment removed from our land, we, the body of Christ, it is upon us. And we must seek him. And we read that verse and we say, seek him. Does that mean go to the art gallery to look at pictures of him? Of course not. No, that's not what he means. It's this communion with him. It's this daily living in his influence and by his direction are seeking him as the first option of our choice in our daily walk with him. And those that seek me early shall find me. Some more, I'm just going to read some more of this because it gives you such understanding and just rounds out the understanding of this, of this idea. Not merely in the morning is he talking about. There's some night owls among us that would never seek God at 6 a.m. I'm just telling you that, okay? You understand that? All right. 
And those that seek me early shall find them, not merely in the morning or even necessarily early in life, although in youth, as near, now listen, as near as possible to the first dawn of reason, though this is certainly of a benefit. Now look, when our kids were young, our prayer was, Lord, help them to get saved at an early age. There's nothing wrong with that. While I'm saying that's not necessarily what this verse is saying, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. In fact, that was our intention. That was our prayer. I've got one granddaughter and one grandson on the way. You know, we're already praying that they find God and he gets, they get saved at an early age. Amen. If we will see him, find him early, we can avoid a, so many consequences yes. in life. And those of you that are older when you found God, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. <clears throat> So there is a benefit to that. To the young, this is, great, this is a gracious promise that is particularly of benefit. If they seek, they shall find. Others who are old may seek and find, but never to such advantage as they, as they would have done had they sought him early. Youth is the time of advantage in every respect. It is the time of learning, of discipline, of improvement, of acquiring useful, solid, gracious habits. My first boss out of college, he... Uh, he, he had me come and do a, um, an interview on Thanksgiving weekend. I mean, I was graduated in December of 96. And I had done all the things you're supposed to do your senior year, put all these applications in and everything. I had one guy, my hydrology teacher. He was an old German dude. Um, everybody hated him until you got all the way through his class, and then you loved him. He was one of those kind of guys. He, he, he had the audacity to have and require it to pass his course now, to buy a particular kind of calculator. I think I've told this story. And when you're a college student, you're scraping for, you know, you find a penny on the ground, you don't pass it up when you're in college. Okay. And so he has this $125 calculator. I can barely afford the 35 Casio the, that I'm using, you know. And he said, if, if she don't get this calculator, she will not pass my course. <laughs> I was angry. I mean, I'm married. I got a kid on the way. I got business I'm running. I'm front time. I, I, he made me buy this calculator. You know what calculator I use today? That same calculator. He was the man. I'm just telling you this because there's, there's a lesson in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> Here we are. I, I've done all the applications and everything, and I didn't have any bites. I mean, I've got a, I, I graduated with honors, man. I had a cool GPA. It was up around four or so. It was under four. Just barely. But, you know, I, it's not like I did bad in school or anything, but no one was offering me a job. I mean, I think, I think the fact that I had my own business when I was in college actually was a negative to them. You know, this guy's never going to listen to anything we tell him to do. That's probably what it was. They probably weren't wrong either. Um, <laughs> I was pretty tenacious as a young man. Uh, I'm much more mellow now. Um, <laughs> this was the guy. So anyways, we, I finally I was, had one interview at, at college there. And, and we were, you know, the guys that are the seniors that are interviewing for jobs were all dressed in suits, you know, like I am today, in fact. And, and here, here he comes. I can't, Lord forgive me, I can't remember his name. I wish I'd, I can see his face, though. And he said, uh, he said young men, let me tell you, they want you for your brain. They do not want you for your zoot. <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, now that I'm older, I can appreciate what he was saying. Um, meanderings of an engineer. Where in the world was I with that? I'm going to get back to my notes. Anyways. <laughs> Others who are old may seek and follow. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> My first boss. Okay, I'm going to get to the story here. Get out of this rabbit hole I'm in. Um, first boss, go over there, drive from Pensacola to Mobile. It's an hour trip. And on Sunday, or, or Saturday, after, right after Thanksgiving. Uh, no, you know, I know Thanksgiving on Thursday, folks. The Saturday after Thanksgiving. Drive over to Mobile. Drive to the facility. And it's, you know, one of those, it's not on some high-rise in Mobile. It's one of the urban-type office buildings, you know, single story. And you got a parking lot all the way around. It comes off a major, you know, major arterial road, we call them. And um, go and drive around there. And as I drive around, I'm looking for the right, you know, unit there, that the address of which office to go into and have this interview. And I'm dressed in a, in a zoot like I am today. And 
I go up there and I'm driving around. I'm trying to find this place, and you know, almost at, there's a janitor guy out there. I almost asked him which one it was. I said, "No, nah, that guy didn't know what's going on. He was a scruffy-looking dude with a pair of jeans and an old shirt and smoking a cigarette. Yeah, that guy can't know anything." And so I keep driving around. I go out on the road, come back again. And you know what? The place where I'm supposed to go is right where that guy's standing in front of. <laughs> this can't be true. I walk up to him like I was talking to the janitor. And I said, I'm looking for Lyle Stover. I'm looking for David Lyle. I'm David Lyle. He talked almost exactly like, uh, like Alex Jones. I'm David Lyle. I thought, what have I got myself into? This is my first job. I'm an engineer and everything. And this guy is a guy that I'm working for. He, we go in and we go into the, auditor into the office and he goes into this meeting room and there's a big round table and it's full of smoke. He'd been smoking in there. I don't know. He'd gone through three packs already. It was 10 in the morning or something like that. And he's got his feet propped up watching the Texas A&M Texas football game. Are you gonna be an engineer? Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know. Your GPA is too high. You want to be? I don't know if I should hire you. What? This is the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. I've worked hard all my life, and I get to the first interview that I'm gonna have for the first job as an engineer. I've got a child and everything, and this guy's telling me that my grades are too good. The janitor is telling me this, it seems like. The best man I ever worked for in my life. He got saved when he was older. That's the point of this. He got saved when he was older. He didn't care about pretenses. Okay? He didn't care about looking a certain part. The man was a genius. Okay? He designed things no one would touch. All right? I learned more from him than I, in, in, in the three and a half years I worked for him, I learned more from him than four years of college ever. In fact, I learned more with him in six months than I learned for four years of college. Okay. Point is, and what I'm getting to, yeah, he wasn't, he didn't get the benefit of being saved early in life. He was really rough around the edges, I got to tell you. But he had a heart for God. He loved the Lord. And he wasn't ashamed to let anybody know it. Aren't you glad you came to church today for that story? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, there's a benefit to seeking God early. And we should pray that our children find God early and get saved early. Um, but that's not what's in view here. What's actually in view here is that we seek God right away. That we seek God at the first opportunity we get and not wait until we dig ourselves into an 18-foot deep hole and now we've got to be hoisted out of it. That's what's in view. Seeking me early. Look, when we were raising our kids, we always strive to bring up champions for Christ, not just Christians. It wasn't good enough that we just have kids that are called Christians. Everybody calls themselves Christians, especially on TV every two or four years. It doesn't mean anything anymore. We wanted champions for Christ. We, we, we wanted to teach them how to seek God and seek Him early and seek Him earnestly and seek Him fervently. We wanted them to have a relationship with the Lord, not just fulfilling a bunch of do's and don'ts, and thou shalt and thou shalt not. That's what's in view here when we say seeking God. Jeremiah 29, 13, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. Matthew Henry, <coughs> it's a matter of searching him with all of our heart. This shall be an answer to their prayers and supplications to God. God will stir them up to prayer. Listen to this. What pastor's letter that Sarah just wrote, read is about. God will stir them up to pray. Then shall thou call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me. Note, this is a high of this underlined, because this is so where we are as Liberty Fellowship and as a country today. When God is about to give his people the expected good, he pours out a spirit of prayer. And it is a good sign that he is coming towards them in mercy. When we find ourselves where God is making it very plain and obvious that we should be praying more fervently, this is a great hope. This is encouraging. This is exciting. We should be praising the Lord for these things that come about to draw us to him in prayer and to seek him. And that's what's happening at Liberty Fellowship. And that's what, quite frankly, is happening in the United States today, I believe. Will we seek God is the question. That's what's in view. Then when you see the expected in approaching, then shall you call me. 
Note that these promises of God are not to supersede prayer, but they quicken and encourage prayer. And when deliverance is coming, we must go by prayer. We must, we must by prayer go forth to meet it. If we're not praying, we're going to miss out on the blessings of God is what's happening here. And as the blessings of God, as God is wanting to give it to us in the time when it's right, we, if we are wise and see the times, as, the, as Isaiah talks about the wise men who could recognize the significance of the times they were in, if we can see that as God's people and it draws us to pray and to seek him, hallelujah, Amen. there is blessing on the way. Amen? Yes. When Daniel understood that the 70 years were expiring, he set his face more fervently than ever to seek his God. Get this. God is trying to pour out a blessing, I believe, now for us as a church and us as a nation. But we have to do our part, and our part is praying and seeking God. John Gill, and we shall seek him and find him. When persons seek the Lord aright, they always find them. I'm going to repeat things here because I'm trying to drive it into my thick skull and, and your skull. <laughs> when persons seek the Lord aright, they always find him, a God-hearing prayer, a God in Christ, bestowing favors upon them, granting them his presence, indulging them in communion with him on a daily basis, and favoring them with fresh supplies of his grace and everything needful for them, every mercy, temporal and spiritual. That is, when they seek him in Christ, who is the only way to the Father, under the guidance and influence of the Holy Spirit, in the exercise of faith and upon him and his promises, with fervency of spirit and ardor of mind, Mind, with diligence, importunity, with earnest desires and strong affections, and as follows, with all sincerity of soul. Are you getting the picture here? We should be excited. There's some zeal here, folks. When ye shall search for me with all of your heart, which, as Calvin rightly observes, does not design perfection. We're not talking about a loss of salvation here, and I'm going to hit on this a little bit later. But we're not, salvation's not in view here. We're way beyond this. We're disciples of Christ, ambassadors for Christ. But integrity and sincerity and maintenance of communion and sanctification in Christ, when they draw nigh with a true heart and call upon him in truth and search for him with eagerness, with a hearty desire to find him as men search for gold and silver and hid treasure. Are you seeking him like you would? If you knew gold was out in the parking lot, how many of you already be out there? I'm telling you, folks, the wisdom of God in seeking Christ on a daily basis is far more value than any gold out in the parking lot. So why don't we seek him that way? In fact, why are some people more faithful to their secular jobs than their places and duties in the house of God? God, forgive us. God knows what we have need of. I'm not saying that there are some Sundays you're going to have to miss. I want some view here. But if you don't have your priorities straight and you don't see God as your source of everything, including the money, including everything to pay your bills, the next thing you know, anything and everything that will get you away from God's house and the hearing of God's word is going to get you away from it and you will be the worse off for it. That is not seeking God, folks. They, God's people today, the church, Remember, these guys are writing 300, almost 300 years ago. This is not just something that I'm contriving. This is 300 some odd years ago these men were writing this, based on principles from far further beyond than that. They, God's people today, the church, would be forced to apply to God because of the afflictions God brought on them. To, to give them a spirit of prayer. He will bring them home to himself by afflictions. When men began, listen to this, when men begin to complain more of their sins than of their afflictions, then there begins some hope of them. Amen. Yeah. Let me reread that. When man begins to complain more of their sins than their afflictions, then there begins to be some hope of them. And when under the conviction of sin and the corrections of the rod, we must seek the knowledge of God. Those who are led by severe trials to seek God earnestly and sincerely will find him a present help and an effectual refuge. For with him is plenteous redemption for all who call upon him. There is solid peace and there only where God is. 
We see our pastor in need. We see our country in need. Where should we be doing? Where should we be and what should we be doing? Amen. Praying and seeking God. Amen. Though, no, those who neglect God and seek to creatures for help, to man and his ways and his means and his methods, will certainly be disappointed. Amen. Those who depend on them for support will find them not foundations, but broken reeds. Those who depend upon them for supply will find them not fountains, but broken cisterns. Those who depend upon them, that is man, for comfort and a cure will find them miserable comforters and physicians of no value. This passage that I'm referencing here was talking about the nation of Judah where they sought the king of Assyria for assistance when they were in trouble. And this is what the commentary, the kings of Assyria whom Judah and Israel sought unto distressed them and helped them not. The king, they had, they had in Hosea, we find that they had sent to the king of Assyria a present, a good fee, and having so retained him of counsel for themselves, they doubted not his fidelity to them. They trusted in the king of Assyria. But he, the king of Assyria, deceived them. As an arm of flesh does those that trust in it. We are seeing this today in the evangelical community. I'm reminded, I've mentioned this before, I'm reminded of 9-11. I remember where I was when that happened. I was sitting in my office, looking at a bunch of drawings, and I get the news. And didn't really, and to be honest, didn't really understand the significance of it at the time. Probably most of us didn't. Jerry Falwell gets on, and he says, this is God's judgment. Because of abortion, because of several other people he, groups he identified. The churches were full that Sunday, as I've recounted previously. <laughs> we didn't put out any advertisements. It was just, it happened on its own. Jerry Falwell gets on TV, says this, God is angry with us because of abortion and because of this, 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 this group. And then he gets a phone call. And 48 hours later, he says, ah, I made a mistake in what I said. Pastor had a very close relationship with Jerry Falwell, so I don't mean any disrespect. But I do think that's significant. You remember the story of Mary, whenever she found out that she's going to be with child, and she naturally asked, how is this going to be? And the angel didn't rebuke her. The angel went to Zechariah and told him, your wife is going to give you. He said the same thing. How is that going to be? But yet the angel rebuked him. Why? Because he was a seasoned, mature man of God who should have known better. That's why. Jerry Falwell should have known better. He wasn't wrong that God was judging America right. then. Amen. He lists some names and groups of people. You know the group he should have named? Us. That's who he should have named. He should have named the church. He should have, I'm not going to be overly dogmatic about this. I can't be. The man's, But he should have named the body of Christ. That's what Scripture says. Amen. And he would have been right for doing so. Right. And what happens is the White House calls up and says, we don't want you to do that because if the American people understand that God is angry with them, they might repent. We want them to be mad at those people over there, those terrorists that we're going to sit here and create a war on for the next 20 years. Wow. And if you mess this up, Jerry Falwell, you're going to undermine all the contracts that we have established with the defense contractors and the, and the military industrial complex. And now this is going to be lost. And all the Zionists aren't going to get their wars. That's what was happening there, folks. But we clap am trying to get you to recognize we. We. 20 some odd years later yes. and here we are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what would have happened right. if that man of God would have not capitulated mm. 
to keeping and maintaining the seat at the table. What would have happened? Maybe it wouldn't have been different. But maybe it would have. Maybe God would have honored that. Maybe, God, maybe there would have been repentance. Maybe there would have been afflictions that drew people to God and they sought God 20 some odd years ago and we wouldn't be dealing with the things we're dealing now. Yes. Well, we are here. And we are dealing with the things that we're dealing with now. And God is trying to get our attention now. Yes. Now, people of LF, people online, and people, I hope people watch this across this country, understand that now is a time that we have to get serious with this business of seeking God unless you want further uh, judgment on your posterity, on your family, on your churches, and on yourself. Amen. It is time to repent. It is time to pray. It is time to seek God. It's time to quit playing church and start having a communion with Christ and having the power of God on our lives that we can affect the people around us and see God able to bring justice and righteousness to this land again. I will go, this passage in Isaiah, God says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. He will return to his place when he has corrected them. He's not going to regard them. He's going to hide. I just said earlier, he wants to be found of you, not in a condition of backsliding and, and sin that you've allowed to take over your life. I'm not talking about the slip up. I'm talking about the Christian who's allowed sin to dominate their lives, who's backslidden who has become lazy and complacent and lethargic in their Christianity, in their walk with God, not their Christianity, in their walk with God. Amen. And the only thing that's going to fix that is seeking him again. But until that happens, the commentary here, God will return to his place when he has corrected them, not regarding them, hiding his face from them, not taking notice of their troubles or prayers. And this is for their further humiliation till they are qualified in some measure for the return of his favor. Get that picture in your minds, folks. That's where we are in the United States today. Amen. He will work. He will at length work upon them and bring them home to himself. Yeah, those he loves, he chastens. And he will chasten. I know. I experienced it. He will work. He will at length work upon them and bring them home to himself by their afflictions which is the thing he waits for. And then he will no longer withdraw from them. He's waiting for two things, their penitent confession of sin, till they acknowledge their offense. They will, be, they will stand guilty till they are sensible of their guilt and be brought to own it and humble themselves before God for it. That's where we as the American people need to get to. That's where the people in our churches need to get to. Do we understand our situation before God that he's angry with us? And that only by seeking him and praying will he turn his hand of judgment away from us. And this is what and this is that which God requires of us. When we are under his correcting hand, that we own ourselves and our fault and justly and when we are justly corrected, we own the fact that we've messed up, when we have offended him. And we are willing to take Whatever he decides is good for us to bring us to a place of correction and maturity. It is when God, when people stop complaining about their afflictions and start complaining of their sin, that there's hope for them, that's what's in view here. That's what this seeking God is about, among other things. Their humble petition, the favor of God, till they seek my face, which it may be expected they will do when they are brought to the last extremity. But why do we have to get that far? Why do we have to get to the end of our rope before we seek God? Instead of seeking him early. In their affliction, they will seek me early, that is diligently, earnestly, and with great importunity. If they seek him thusly and be sincere in it, though it might be called seeking him late because it is long before they decided to do it, yet it is not too late with God. Nay, he is pleased to call it seeking him early. This is the great benevolence and love of our God. Yes. You know, there is no time with him. He is happy that if it that took that to get you to come back to me, praise God. Think of the prodigal son. And as soon as the prodigal son turned to his father, and as soon as the father saw him a way off, he didn't wait for him to get to him. He went to him. Picture that in your mind. That is our God. 
When we find ourselves in these afflictions, we find ourselves in this situation, and we get to our right mind finally, and we seek God, God promises to be found of us, and quickly. Why are we waiting? Note that when we're under the conviction of sin and the correcting the corrections of the rod. Our business is to seek God's face. We must desire the knowledge of him and the acquaintance with him that he may manifest himself to us and for us in token of his being a peace for us. And it may be reasonably, it may reasonably be expected that affliction will bring those to God that had long gone astray from him and kept at a distance. That was me as a teenager. That was me running from God, wanting to do my own thing, knowing all the time what the Holy Spirit was saying, you're messing up. You're going the wrong direction. You're going the wrong direction. And all the time said, but this is my idol. This is who I'm serving. I was there. I lived it. I know this firsthand. I also know, man. Uno momento, por favor. The freedom. The deliverance. The... Yes. Removing the weight of all that guilt yeah. and confusion. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't see my kids. Go. That's why I was so adamant. And my, I'm sounding like Chuck. <laughs> and why I'm so adamant and why my wife is so adamant about our kids knowing God early. I didn't want them to live that life I'd lived. Our prayer was that they would get found out quickly. And we kept a wide eyes wide open on them too. Just by the way, don't treat your two-year-olds like teenagers. It doesn't work. You don't reason with a two-year-old. Because they're smarter than you and they'll smart you. <laughs> and don't treat your teenagers like a two-year-old. I've seen parents do that. You've got to get those kids to understand that there is a right and wrong. When they're young, it's black and white. You don't explain it. You say, because mom, dad said so, that's why. And don't, don't do anything different than that. But by the time they're 11 and 12 and 13, now you start having to give them the why behind the, the, why behind the what. And you point them to the nature and love of God. And you point them to the fact that, you know, one day you're going to be on your own. You're going to be an adult and you're going to answer to God directly. Your mom dad's not going to be here to give you all the answers. And you're going to stand before God yourself. So you teach those kids, those teenagers, how to find God in God's word. Oh, they're not ready yet. Don't send them out like they're 20. But you're preparing them to be champions for Christ. Amen. When you, I'm parking here. I, this is why I was so passionate about it and why I'm so passionate about seeing my kids, my grandkids have a life where they're not under the, all the kind of consequences of our disobedience. We, our, our prayer, we sought God for them. And if I, as a father, would be like that, think of our Heavenly Father Amen. and how much He loves us and how He's ready to be found of us and if we seek Him. And what does it mean to seek Him? It means to seek Him sincerely, to seek Him fervently, to seek Him constantly. No, when we are under the convictions of sin, I think I already read that. Therefore, God, for a time, turns away from us that He may turn us to Himself and then return to us. Man, this is the part of the message I could stop. I'll tell you what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to summarize this, and I think I'm going to break it here. And unless pastors, unless, if pastors' vocal cords are better, you just won't ever hear it. <laughs> Not from me. He will. But I've got to cover this before I stop. Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, doesn't that tell you that you could lose your salvation? 
No, don't you say that. No. This has everything to do with seeking God. John Gill's commentary on this is so spot on. It's perfect. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which is to be understood not in such a sense as though men could obtain and procure for themselves spiritual and eternal salvation by their own works and doings. For such a sense is contrary to the scriptures, which deny any part of salvation as election, justification, and calling, and the whole of it be of works, but ascribe it to the free grace of God. Amen. Amen. And also, and is also repugnant to the perfections of God as his wisdom, grace, and righteousness. For where are the wisdom and love of God in forming a scheme of salvation and sending his son to effect it on the cross? And after all, it is left to men to work it out for themselves? That makes no sense. And if God is anything, he is a rational being. And where is the justice of God in admitting to of an of admitting of an imperfection or of an imperfect righteousness in the room or in the stead of the perfect work of Christ? They can't coexist. The imperfect workings of man can never measure up to the perfect work of Christ. So whatever is in view here in this verse, it is not salvation, folks. Do you realize throughout the church history how much suffering and persecution and death has, caused, has been caused because of this lack of understanding, the difference between justification and sanctification? The amount of corrupt, unsafe men that have taken advantage, taken advantage of the church and the body of Christ over the history of the church and to the present day because of this lack of understanding. You cannot be an ambassador of Christ if you're constantly under the, under the fear of losing your salvation, no, you can never be affected. And God's going to do it that way? Ever. That's why, among other things, that's why you have to understand the fault of Zionism. Because it tries to bring back the rituals of Judaism into the church. Like the work of Christ is incomplete and we need more. That's blasphemy, folks. Yeah. Unadulterated <laughs> blasphemy. <clears throat> For these, we'll go back to the commentary. For these are imperfect, even the best of them of the works of man. And is another reason against the sense of the passage. For and where and were they perfect, even if man's work were perfect. It's still the work of man, which is a created being under the authority of God. You cannot in any way fashion it that the works of man, even if they were complete in the sense of the judgment of man, are still not adequate versus the perfections of God. Do you understand? So I want to drive this point home. Moreover, was salvation to be obtained by mix, moreover, was salvation to be obtained by the works of man? These consequences would follow. The death of Christ would be in vain. Boasting would be encouraged in men, Ephesians 2, 8, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. This is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If it were true that it was by the works of man, then man could glorify in himself. And they would have whereof the glory. And their obligations of obedience, taken from the love of God, and redemption of Christ would be gone. We serve God out of a heart of love for what he has done for us, not out of an obligation because of a bunch of do's and don'ts we have to meet in order to stand right before God. That's so far missing from the truth of God's word here, folks. Go into church on Sunday, kneel in when you're supposed to kneel, stand when you're supposed to stand, sing when you're supposed to stay, sing, spit out your bubble gum before you go in, go to the bathroom. All those things you're supposed to do that you know you're supposed to do to be caught to consider spiritual in church on every Sunday is nothing at all in view for the disciple of Christ who has a relationship with the Creator God through the mediator Jesus Christ. Amen. And redemption by Christ would be weakened and destroyed 
Add to all of this that the scriptures assure us that salvation is alone by Christ and that it is already finished by him and not to be wrought out now by him or any other in any other kind of way. It's not, there's, no, there's, no another, there's no second crucifixion. There's no other temple need. There's no more sacrifices. That will never happen. Amen. Never. Amen. Once and for done, all, it's been done. Amen. Applaud. Thank you. Whatever sense these words have, they may be sure that this can never be possible by the sense of them. That is, works justify man. The words may be rendered, work about your salvation. Employ yourselves in the things which accompany salvation as a result of salvation. When, when the James said, I will show you my faith by my works. He wasn't saying I'm saved because of the works. I'm sa I have worked because I'm saved. This is vitally important here why I'm parking on this because if we're going to understand this seeking God and why we're seeking God, we're not seeking God so that we can say that we know that we have salvation. If we're constantly doubting salvation, we'll be worthless. Satan will always have you doubting that. Always. Put that behind you. We're talking about seeking God as a relationship with our Father, our Heavenly Father, having a zeal and a daily communion with Him that we may be effectual for His kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Think back to the disciples' prayer. Why did God say pray that way? That's, this is why. And if we're going to remove God's judgment from our land, we must seek Him. I've been teaching two teenagers so long that I've become redundant. Get used to it. I hope you'll remember this when you walk out into the parking lot. Where was I? Uno momento, por favor. The death of Christ would be in vain. Boasting would be encouraging men. We got all the way through that here. That it is impossible for them to ever affect it. Therefore, whatever sins these were, here we go. The words may be written, work about your salvation. Employ yourselves in things that accompany salvation and be performed by all those that expect it though not to be expected for the performance of them. Do you get the distinction? You know, those poor souls that you've known who are relying on their rituals and on their faithfulness to a practice and therein have their hope, so sad. They know something's wrong in it. There's a hole in their heart. You talk to these people. And they know something's wrong, but they can't put their finger on it. And those people that are lording it over them to keep them in submission to their agenda won't tell them. And by only a grace and the miracle of God will they find the answer. Amen. Right. But God does promise if they seek him that he'll, they'll find him. Man has done much damage over the confusion of this issue and restricted and restrained the work of God in so many ways. Such as hearing, okay, some of the things expected of the poor, such as hearing the word, submission to gospel ordinances, and a discharge of every branch of moral, spiritual, and evangelical obedience for which the apostle before commends them. We are to be about our Father's business, as the Lord said. That's what's in view here with this verse. Obeying his gospel, attending constantly to his word and ordinances, Distar discharging every duty in faith and fear until at last they shall receive the end of their faith, the salvation of their souls, their assurance, not, not their salvation as attaining it, salvation as seeing the results of it and being ushered into glory with Jesus Christ. That's what that's saying. <laughs> Do the work or the business of your lives, the work you are to do in your generation, which God has prescribed and directed you to do with the grace of God, which the grace of God teaches and the love of Christ constrains us to do. That's seeking God, folks. Do all that with fear and trembling, not with slavish fear of hell and damnation, lest they should fall away or finally miss heaven because they're constantly doubting their salvation and therefore never really save it, they don't understand it. Since this would be a distrust of the power and faithfulness of God, nor is it reasonable to suppose that the apostle, the apostle would exhort to such fear when he himself was so confidently assured that the good work begun in them would be performed. And beside, the exhortation would be very oddly formed if this was the sense. 
This means work out your salvation, not with fear of damnation, but this fear and trembling spoken of is that which is consistent with the highest acts of faith, trust, confidence, joy, and is opposed to pride and vainglory and intends modesty and humility, which is what the apostle is presenting throughout the whole context. And here urges us to a cheerful and constant obedience to Christ with all humility of soul, without, without dependence on our work, but dependence on Christ. Not in vain glorying in our works, but ascribing anything we do for the glory of God. That is seeking God. Folks, we'll continue this message next week, God willing, unless Chuck is better, and then I'd rather him be here. But in the meantime, what does it take for God to remove his judgment from a land? Repentance. Amen. But how do we go about it? By prayer. How do we pray? We've talked about that. And we seek God. And when he sees us seeking him, not just an occasional, like an acquaintance. If your spouse was missing and she didn't come home or he didn't come home when he was supposed to, would you just, oh, oh some might, oh, yes, some might. <laughs> maybe, maybe, with some, maybe everyone needs some marriage counseling there, Sarah, we don't. <laughs> okay, your kids, your spouse and your kids, the people that you love, you would seek them out. Why would we not seek our God out in that way and much more? A daily communion with Christ. That our good works may so shine before men that they glorify our Father which is in heaven and that his will is done on earth even as it is in heaven. Folks, this is what it means to seek God. This is what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. We're not satisfied with just this mere label of Christianity. We want champions for Christ. We want those that are going to go out and serve God in wherever they find themselves to be so that God can have his will done on earth as it is in heaven and that we can have liberty and peace and joy and the free ability to serve our God with a clear conscience without inhibition from a government that wants to be a tyrant over this look at what we've been given and what we're on the cusp of losing let's be faithful to seek god let's stand for prayer